geologists refer to as saprolite. Water that percolates through the ash contains relatively large concentrations of metals, some of which, including strontium, selenium, and arsenic, are not desirable in drinking water. As the ash effluent moves through the saprolite, metals in the effluent are exchanged for naturally occurring metals already held on the surface of the clay and silt particles. As the ion exchange capacity is exhausted, the effluent has to move farther and farther for the exchange to occur. In the case of the ash pond effluent, I found that each foot of saprolite ties up four years of strontium production, just using strontium as one example. Or stated another way, the strontium front advances through the saprolite at a, at a rate of about a quarter of a foot per year. I estimated that the water moves through the saprolite at a rate of about 180 feet per year, or about 700 times faster than the strontium. The point of this discussion is that we want the small amount of effluent that is produced to be able to move into the material, either natural material or a liner we installed, and we want that material to be able to absorb to immobilize the harmful constituents. Goal number five, dilute harmful effluent to harmless concentrations. In goal number four, we attempt to immobilize harmful constituents and effluent through the utilization of cation exchange of certain natural materials. We must recognize, however, that no single defense against pollution is perfect, so that sometimes, hopefully not too often, our best efforts will not be successful. We therefore need to provide redundant safety features in our waste disposal systems whenever possible. We are not concerned in this case with groundwater pollution because we have essentially avoided that problem by placing our waste sites in discharge areas. Our concern then is with, with surface water pollution or specifically with harmful constituents reaching a stream in such concentrations that they would adversely affect use of the water. Our second defense in this case is dilution by the receiving stream. Thus, hazardous waste sites should be located adjacent to the largest perennial streams in each area. Remember that my favorite sites were on the peninsulas between a major stream, stream and a tributary. How is the release of excessive harmful effluent to be detected? I have not mentioned monitoring wells, nor have I shown any on any of the sketches. Monitoring is an important issue that must be addressed. Recall that the secure waste sites required at least three monitoring wells, one upgraded and two downgraded. These wells are clearly intended to confirm the inevitable. In fact, if they do not show pollution after an appropriate length of time, it's obvious that they were not pro properly located. The possibility is great that monitoring wells or the people collecting data from them will miss the pollution that does occur. Thus, as a general rule, reliance on monitoring wells should be avoided whenever possible. How then can the sites I have described be monitored? The key to monitoring lies in the location of the sites. As I noted in the discussion of goal number five, we are only concerned about pollution of the nearby streams to which the effluent must move. Therefore, to determine if effluent is being produced at an unacceptable rate, water samples should be collected during base flow conditions from the streams adjacent to and immediately downstream from the waste sites. And the sampling sites where we have two waste cells as indicated uh, by these symbols are along the bank of the stream nearest the uh, waste sites. If you sample those sites,